topic is my name is sudan chaleya my metric number is 270384 so today i am going to discuss about german historical school let's we start with an introduction the german historical school which arose in the 1840s with the publication of french list and uh, wilhelm rostel was ended in uh, 1917 when gustav skormol died by then uh, economists in general had uh, absorbed uh, some of the ideas of the school and the school uh, no longer existed as a distinct entity like the socialists the german historical economists were generally critical of uh, classical economists next let's we uh, recap the uh, historical background uh, of the uh, german historical school uh, when we focus on the napoleon was uh, where well, it's a conflict between uh, napoleon's friends and a shifting map of the lines uh, the war uh, the war was lasted for 15 years and uh, for a brief of time napoleon was the master of europe the french revolution was the main reason for the napoleon was because of the impact it had had on the uh, rest of the europe in the french revolution the head of state the monarch lost their power and the common people took over with the ideals of liberty equality and fraternity the peace treaty after the napoleonic wars uh, left germany divided into 39 separate states most of the monarchies uh, almost all of them are democratic the victorious great powers of europe manipulated germany to promote their own ulterior purpose austria want to keep germany weak and divided meanwhile britain wished to see a strong prussia so it can prevent france from rising again and then russia desire for itself the part of poland which is not yet seized by the german and the austria meanwhile german struggle against the napoleon had aroused a patriotic and nationalistic emotions as a result many germans uh, demanded uh, unification and uh, constitution reforms but the quest for national unity was uh, frustrated for a half of century the aspiration toward democracy remained unrealized for over a century and then uh, were achieved only briefly under the most adverse condition under the stigma of uh, losing the uh, world war 1 in 1815 the holy alliance of prussia austria and uh, russia was organized as a means of defeating revolution wherever it might threaten minor revolution outburst in germany from 1830 to 1832 were repressed and the major up uh, up hills of uh, 1848 were crushed by prussian and austrian troops while prussia the largest richest most militaristic and most powerful state in germany dominated the country foreign countries saw prussia as a powerful ally foreign and native conservative saw in prussia a uh, bulwark against democracy and socialism native uh, nationalists relied on uh, prussia to forge a unified germany prussia dominated the germany government and uh, armed force a series of successful wars was uh, further strengthened uh, nationalism under prussian uh, hegemony advanced social legislation enacted by bismarck expressed the paternalism of the monarchy and evoked the loyalty and patriotism among german workers bismarck um, bragged that in germany the kings made the revolutions because certain key economic institution of uh, 19th century germany differed substantially from those of uh, britain it is not surprising that a different economic ideology arose Mercantilism uh, regulation uh, persisted in Germany at least until the uh, formation of the empire in 1871 long after they had uh, disappeared from the British scene competition and uh, freedom of uh, enterprise which the classicists took for granted in the economic analysis was severely restricted in Germany 
because of the large bureaucracy that administrated and uh, regulated in a manifold phase of the German economic life, the science of public administration was highly developed. The British theories were obviously inapplicable to the German situation. The historical school defended and rationalized the German way of life by questioning the historical relevance of the British classical economic doctrines or as known as a laissez-faire. The Germany that gave birth to the historical school was divided, weak and primarily agriculture. Nationalism, patriotism, militarism, paternalism, devotion to duty, hard work and a massive government intervention all combined to change the pattern and promote the industrial growth because the Germany of the mid-19th century was, was very very far behind England in the development of industry. Its economies uh, reasoned that the government assistance was required for it to catch up with uh, other countries. The German historical economists generally emphasized the positive role of the government in the economy instead of accepting the classical economic concept uh, laissez-faire because the uh, historical school was uh, nationalistic whereas classic, classical economics was uh, Hindu, individualistic and uh, cosmopolitan. In Germany, it was the state that uh, fostered industry, transportation and economic growth. In the process of the defending a unified economy, it was easy to develop an urban nationalistic glorification of the state. The economy was held to be self-adjusting and uh, tending toward full employment without government inter intervention. Meanwhile, the classical economic uh, rationalized the practice being engaged in, in by the uh, enterprising people. Governments were notoriously wasteful and corrupt. And under these circumstances, the less government intervention, uh, the better. The elevation of the private sector over the public sector serves this end admirably. Thus, the German historical economist prefers to emphasize the concept of the minimal government involvement in the economic instead of accepting the policy of leaving things to take their own cost without interfering. So that's all from me. Thank you. Good morning to doctor and fellow classmates. Myself, Anusha Ganesan. My metric number is still 69836. So, now I will be continuing on major talents where German historical school has four principles. As you guys can see on the slide, the first one is evolutionary approach to economics and the second one will be emphasized on the positive role of government the third is advocacy of consecutive reform and the fourth one is inductive or historical approach so the first principle is evolutionary approach to economics german historical school applied a dynamic evolutionary perspective in its study of society it is also much focus and also concentrated on cumulative that means togetherness development and also growth. There's an analogy drawn to Darwin's evolutionism in biology where it mentions that social organisms begins from born, develops, grows and also finally decays and then dies. And it indicates that society is constantly changing. Because of society is constantly changing, what makes it relevant is the economic doctrine which means the beliefs for one country at a particular time may be irrelevant for another country or another age. This is very realistic approach was especially useful because it used to attack classical economy as it is being very unsuitable for Germany. The second principle is emphasized on the positive role of government. So as we all know, um, German historical school is nationalistic, while classical economics is individualistic and also cosmopolitan. Cosmopolitan means it involves people, many people uh, from different uh, countries. As I mentioned, explained in the 
previous, the first principle, we all know that the social organism is the center of the study. If it is the force for dynamic movement, so the state and also society rather than individual should occupy the center of the stage. So where the state of Germany fostered, that means brings up or encourage the industry, transportation and also the economic growth as because it is giving important to nationalistic compared to individualistic. So the process of defending a unified economy, uh, it was easy to develop an ardent. Ardent means um, a enthusiastic nationalistic glorification of the state. So historical school gave a great prominence that means importance need for state intervention. That means uh, it gave importance for the governments to interfere in economic affairs such as in decision and also stressed that the community has interests of its own uh, that are quite distinct that means might be like different from the state thinking uh, from those of the individual so this is why it emphasizes uh, a positive role of government for the economic growth so the third principle will be advocacy of consecutive reform. Here, they focus that political economy shouldn't be only focused on prom economic activity, but they also should focus and give concentration on the moral merit of this action and also their outcomes where the efficiency and also equity versus theory applied here. And there is also a definition of standard for proper production where the distribution of wealth it should be justified from the demand and also the morality should also be satisfied in this principle the german state should be entrusted with a amelioration which means some new acts of condition for the common man that means the act that the german state entrusted should be justified for all the people in german state not only one particular person and also the moderate reforms and also regarding the loyalty and also nationalism civility to the state will be explained briefly in the further principle. The fourth principle will be inductive or historical approach. It emphasizes the importance of studying the economy inductively or historically, which means it's emphasized from smaller part bring us to the bigger part. For example, from part to the whole, from particulars to general, or from facts to theories. This is because economic and other social phenomena are interdependent. So the political economy cannot be treated adequately except in combination with other branches of social science. Massive inductive study using primary source material uh, such as artifact, document, diary, this can be uh, classified as primary source because it uh, shows raw material which means uh, primary source material and also studying changing the social institution and historical school claim that it historical method allow it to study all the forces of an economic phenomenon and also all the physics of economic behavior, not merely the economic logic. So in today's time, the historical inductive method has become generally accepted as complementary to marginalistic abstract deductive method. So next will be who did the historical school benefit? So first, I will say the German historical school benefits within themselves which means the members of the German historical school. They enjoyed a very close and also friendly relation with government and also the officials. The German government controlled almost most universities and scholars known as the professor maker um, controlled the majority of the academic appointments in Germany because 
uh, he has the influence of Persian Ministry of Education where him and also his followers were departed, were allocated in the academic post and also where the supporters of the Austrian Marginalist School were excluded from the university position because they have no uh, influences as homole. The second group will be dominant business, financial and also land owning groups. The German historical school served them by promoting moderate reforms. That means they promote they they be a um, intermediate person who promote the changes that frustrated the drive for a more radical democratization of society. The promoting of moderate reforms is based on the socialistic ideology. So instead of the poor and lowly fighting and winning their own battles for improvement, concessions were given to them by a paternalistic state where the poorest and low fighting um, people are controlled by the decision taken by someone else for them. So as the result, the loyalty, nationalism and servility to the state were more widespread in Germany as they are taking decision and controlling for others. My name is Rishwisna Sangav Murugesen and my metric number is 272900. Now I am going to present about how was the historical school valid, useful or correct in its time. First of all, the evolutionary approach to society and the economic which, uh, which provided a suitable solution to abstract thinking of the classical and marginalist school. The historical, the historical school was uh, correct in its perspective that economists needed to familiarize themselves with changing uh, history and environments with uh, economic and social evolution to understand the present world. Secondly, inductive method. Inductive factual studies were required for this task. So, new theories and ideas had to be evoked to understand new situations and it is required very careful testing through the use of empirical data. Next, we are going to discuss about which tenets of the historical school become lasting contributions. There are two, which are inductive method and attack on laser sphere. The task of the German historical school was completed, which economists of various persuasions agreed that historical and uh, empirical studies are required to explain the present old theories and to develop new ones. Today, the, uh, the historical inductive method has become generally accepted as complementary to the abstract deductive approach, changing times and methodologically controversies have forced uh, the two into uh, uneasy but uh, tolerably placid marriage. For example, contemporary econometrics analysis normally incorporates both abstract theorizing and empirical testing. The data for the most of the empirical testing and historical as opposed to being derived directly from experiments. Today, however, economists generally search for the most recent historical data available to test their theories as opposed to scrutinizing data gleaned from the distant past. If society is constantly charging and if new situation call for next analysis, the past experience have only limited relevance. Another lasting contribution of school is its attack on laser sphere. This theme was the trend of future. The members of the historical school recognize that unrestricted free enterprise does not necessarily produce the best possible result for society as whole and they are believe that reform can be a substitute for worse upheavals brought on by sharpening class distinctions.
a final word. The German nationalism advocated by the historical economist overreach itself as it evolved into a franchised militarism. In 1914, the hope was rising that the world could achieve peace and universal harmony. The German historical economist struck a strident note of nationalism that jarred these internationalist sentiments of goodwill. Their ideas unintentionally led to World War I and II. In this respect, some of, some of the ideas presented by the historical economist were detrimental to society's progress. Thank you. I will continue our group presentation with the contributors in developing the ideas of German historical school. Friedrich Schlicht Friedrich Schlicht is known as a forerunner of the historical school. He was inclined neither towards formal study in school nor towards his father's occupation as a senior. In the year of 1816, he became a government clerk and had risen to the post of ministerial undersecretary. A year later, which is on 1817, he accepted a professorship in administration and politics at the University of Birmingham. But his dissident political views unfortunately have caused his dismissal in 1819. He then became active in promoting a strong political and commercial union of the German state so that in the year of 1819, Liszt presented a petition for a customs union to the Federal Assembly on behalf of an association of merchants and manufacturers that he had organized. Being elected to his state legislature in 1820, Liszt advocated other administrative and financial reforms that were considered very radical in his state. He favored doing away with tolls on road, features, State ownership of industries, union property taxes, limitation of productive land use, and access duties. On the other hand, he advocated trial by duty, a reduction in the number of civil service officers, and a single direct income tax to meet the expenses of government. The government regarded the expression of these views as constituting treason and sentenced Liszt to serve eight months in prison. From 1825 to 1832, he lived in the United States where he became a farmer, a journalist, a business promoter, and a coal miner. His protectionist ideas gained much more popularity in the United States than in Germany. After returning to Germany, Liszt became an ardent advocate of railway network for Germany. The railway lines later built in Germany were to follow closely his path in a pamphlet published in 1833. His efforts to create a German customs union were only realized in the establishment of the sovereign in 1834. The plans he presented for a German postal system and a national patent law were realized more than 20 years after his death. Ill health, financial difficulties, and despair over the delay in German unification darkened his latest day, and in 1846, he committed suicide. The first contribution of Frederick Liszt to government historical school is protection for infant industry. Liszt advocated free trade within Germany while championing a high tariff against imports of manufacturing goods to protect newly emerging domestic industries. He opposed protection for agriculture because he said agriculture is known as an old and mature industry while manufacturing industry requires cheap food and also cheap raw materials for the labor. Besides, he also stressed that the development of larger scale industries through protection would enlarge the home market for agriculture. Other than that, Liszt also condemned Adam Smith and classical economics for claiming universality for doctrine that were appropriate for England but inappropriate for underdeveloped countries. Liszt popularized the idea of stages of economic growth and urged that the government actively assist the people who wish to part from a lower to higher state against the competition of more advanced nations. Only after a country reached the industrial maturity 
could eat river to free trade. The second contribution is Liz Dinat's Smith's notion of the harmony of interest between the individual and the society. He argued that the immediate private interests of certain members of the community do not necessarily lead to the highest good of the whole. For example, a nation may suffer from an absence of manufacturing industry, but some people may flourish in selling foreign manufacturers to domestic consumers. One person may grow rich by extreme parsimony, but if a whole nation follows that person's example, there will be no consumption and no support of the industry. He concluded that national unity is necessary to the individual whose interest should be subordinated to the preservation of peace oneness. The last contribution of Frederick Lee is military preparation, wars, and war debt. Lee said, this may in certain cases immensely increase the productive powers of a country. He pointed to England as an example. War expands its productive power so much that it will increase values it receives annually and the increase in output produced. In addition, spending money on supplying its armies means shipping goods to the theater of war, which ruined foreign manufacturers and ensured England's industrial supremacy. Good day, Dr. Ed, to all my classmates. And Rashid Raman Matrix number 269614 will be presenting about Wilhelm Rocher until the end of the talk. Wilhelm Rocher was one of the founders of the older historical school. Rocher became professor of political economy at Gottingen and later at Leipzig. He produced five volume textbook called Economic Science. This book took over 40 years to complete, which is from the year 1854 until the end of the 1894. The first volume was translated to English named Principles of Political Economy, which 13 editions by the year 1878. Wilhelm Rocher is originally the founder of All School of Thought. The Old School of Thought wanted to supplement the classical theory. Meanwhile, Young School of Thought wanted to supplant it entirely with historical studies and policy. When Rocher was young, he rejected the idea of the classical school. But then, he still built his ideas by using classical economics as well. This was the basis for the Young School of Thought to condemn Old School of Thought. Rocha used the historical method to establish the law of economic development. The historical method consists of investigation of history's legal, political, and other aspects. Rocha emphasized that the object of political economy is not to establish the best possible state of things, but to describe the actual state of the economy's continual development. He also added that from the use of historical method, it does away with feelings of self-sufficiency and the higher civilization won't look down with contempt on lower ones. Societies are continually evolving from immature to major forms which consider the most perfect. The major societies, however, eventually decline and decay and we have seen this in the evolution chart. Rocher showed his empathy for economic theory by including a simplified version of English classical price theory in his Principles of Political Economy. Instead of rigid abstract theory, he sought to discover its historical basis. He claimed that the study of the contemporary facts and opinions is an essential adjournment and important additions to the classical deductive method. Now I'll explain about Gustav Schmoll. Gustav Schmoller is a leading figure of the younger historical school. He was a professor of political science at Halle, Strasbourg, and Berlin. Being a professor, he taught a lot of students and administration officials and hold a great influence in academic as well as government sector. In addition to his work as a professor, Schmoller was an active member of the Academy of Sciences and also of the House of Lords of the Prussian Diet. He was one of the founders and a major leader of the Berlin Free Social Policy, which is also known as Association of Social Policy. This organization advocated social legislation and helped promote the idea of greater government activity in social and economic affairs. Smaller contended that the task of accumulating historical and descriptive factual materials is far more important than the deductive theory writing. 
He criticized extremely the separate study of small segments of economic phenomena and the assumption that the, everything else remained unchanged. According to them, the effects of economic processes are lost once they are isolated and fragmented. Smaller wanted to develop economics exclusively on the basis of historical monographs. In fact, Smaller was so antagonistic to the deductive economics that he declared publicly that members of the abstract school were unfit to teach in German universities. The method and Schill. Method and Schill was a very famous controversy between Schmoller and Karl Menger, the founder of Austrian marginalist school. The debate was about which method is more effective and suitable for economic studies, or which method is more important. Is it the deductive or is it the inductive? Before we move to what happened in the modern state, let's see what is deductive and inductive method. Deductive method is the analytical and abstract approach pioneered by David Ricardo. Ricardo began with basic premises and later he used logic to deduce generalizations. His tendency is to use assumptions to bolster his arguments. The method of partial equilibrium analysis championed by many members of marginalist school was useful for abstracting from the complexity of the real world in order to better understand it. This approach allowing one variable at a time to change while holding all other variables temporarily constant, which enabled the investigators to dissect complex phenomena one step at a time. The inductive approach. Smaller emphasized the importance of studying the economy inductively or historically. As an example, we study economics from part to the whole, from particulars to general, or from facts to the theories. This is because economic and other social phenomena are interdependent. Political economy cannot be treated adequately except in combination with other branches of social sciences. Generally, inductive studies use primary sources, material, and study changes in social institutions. The German historical school claimed that its historical method allowed it to study all the, for, all the forces of an economic phenomenon, all the facets of economic behavior, not merely their economic logic. The method on Schick started in 1883 when Menger published a book on methodology that defended theoretical analysis and rated smaller school as merely secondary in importance. Smaller reviewed the book unfavorably in his charge book, Smaller's Yearbook, and Menger replied in an angry pamphlet titled Errors of Historicism, in which he wrote, The historians have stepped upon the territory of our science like foreign conquerors in order to force upon us their language and their customs, their terminology and their methods, and to fight intolerantly every branch of inquiry which does not correspond with their special method. When Smaller received a copy of Mengel's pamphlet for review in his judgment, he printed an announcement that he was unable to review it because he had written it immediately to the author. Schmoller also printed the insulting letter to Menger that he had included with the pamphlet. This controversy aroused bitter feelings and resulted in many publications on both sides. In the end, the method seemed to resolve itself into belief that both inductive and deductive methods are important and that they normally supplement each other. We stated the gathering of information and the establishing of analytical tools with which to handle the accumulated information are both instrumental part of sound economic science. For further example, contemporary econometric analysis normally incorporates both abstract theorizing and empirical testing. The data for most of the empirical testing are historical as opposed to the being derived directly from the experiments. Social reforms. Smaller believe that ethical value judgments are to be encouraged. Justice in the economic system is to be realized through a paternalistic policy of social reform furthered by the state and all social groups. The guiding principle of social reforms, he said, is more equitable distribution of income. 
social science is to be the guide for the attainment of the objective of social policy. Smaller accused the older historical school of attempting to apply the lessons of history too quickly. He called for much more historical study in order to establish an empirical basis for national economic theory. Yet, despite the innumerable massive historical studies, he and his disciples published they failed to produce an economic theory and their major contributions lay in the area of economic history only. Protectionism Schmoller was an ardent advocate of free trade during his younger age, but he changed his views on protectionism late in his life. He favored a protective tariff for Germany by 1901 and he hired Alexander Hamilton and Friedrich List as his teachers. He denied that the new era of protectionism had arisen. Economists and statements had been unable to understand the beautiful arguments for free trade. He justified tariffs on the basis of least infant industry argument, but he went further than that. He felt that tariffs are international weapons that might benefit a country if used skillfully. Conclusion the German historical school is mostly about the result of social problems arising from population growth at this time and those emerging with industrialization in Germany. The German historical school, which I will mention as GHS, arose in 1840s with the publication of Friedrich List and Wilhelm Rocher and ended in 1970 when Gustav Schmoller died. For the younger historical school, the economic crisis of the 1870s was an important departure point in demanding state intervention in economics. German historical schools in general were critical of classic economics. They criticized the abstract, deductive, static, unrealistic, and historical qualities of classical and marginalist methodology. German historical school suggested the use of evolutionary and inductive method in economic analysis and emphasized government intervention in the economy through conservative reform. German historical school economists tried to improve the situation of ordinary people by improving their health status, living status, and efficiency as a factory workers. As a result, the combination of nationalism patriotism, militarism, paternalism, devotion to duty and hard work and massive government intervention not only promote the industrial growth in Germany but also strengthen the loyalty of workers and ordinary people to the state and prevent them from supporting the extreme socialist ideology. That's all from us today. I hope you all enjoy our presentation. Thank you.